Chapter six, part one of The Shadow Line, a Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter six, part one. As we all went up, it occurred to me that there ought to be a man at the helm. I raised my voice not much above a whisper, and noiselessly, an uncomplaining spirit in a fever wasted body appeared in the light aft the head with hollow eyes illuminated against the blackness which had swallowed up our world and the universe the bared forearm extended over the upper spokes seemed to shine with a light of its own i murmured to that luminous appearance keep the helm right amidships it answered in a tone of patient suffering right amidships sir then i descended to the quarter-deck it was impossible to tell whence the blow would come to look round the ship was to look into a bottomless black pit. The eye lost itself in inconceivable depths. I wanted to ascertain whether the ropes had been picked up off the deck. One could only do that by feeling with one's feet. In my cautious progress I came against a man in whom I recognized Ransom. He possessed an unimpaired physical solidity which was manifest to me at the contact. He was leaning against the quarter-deck capstan and kept silent. It was like a revelation. He was the collapsed figure sobbing for breath I had noticed before we went on the poop. You have been helping with the mainsail, I exclaimed in a low tone. Yes, sir, sounded his quiet voice. Man, what were you thinking of? You mustn't do that sort of thing. After a pause, he assented. I suppose I mustn't. Then after another short silence, he added, I am all right now, quickly between the tell-tale gasps. I could neither hear nor see anybody else, but when I spoke up, answering sad murmurs filled the quarter-deck, and its shadows seemed to shift here and there. I ordered all the halyards laid down on deck, clear for running. I'll see to that, sir, volunteered Ransom, in his natural pleasant tone, which comforted one and aroused one's compassion, too, somehow. That man ought to have been in his bed, resting, and my plain duty was to send him there but perhaps he would not have obeyed me. I had not the strength of mind to try. All I said was, go about it quietly, Ransom. Returning on the poop, I approached Gambril. His face, set with hollow shadows in the light, looked awful, finally silenced. I asked him how he felt, but hardly expected an answer. Therefore I was astonished at his comparative loquacity. Them shakes leaves me as weak as a kitten, sir, he said, preserving finally that air of unconsciousness as to anything but his business the helmsman should never lose. And before I can pick up my strength, that there hot fit comes along and knocks me over again. He sighed. There was no complaint in his tone, but the bare words were enough to give me a horrible pang of self-reproach. It held me dumb for a time. When the tormenting sensation had passed off, I asked, do you feel strong enough to prevent the rudder taking charge if she gets sternway on her? It wouldn't do to get something smashed about the steering gear now. We've enough difficulties to cope with as it is. He answered with just a shade of weariness that he was strong enough to hang on. He could promise me that she shouldn't take the wheel out of his hands. More he couldn't say. At that moment, Ransom appeared quite close to me stepping out of the darkness into visibility suddenly, as if just created with his composed face and pleasant voice. Every rope on deck, he said, was laid down clear for running, as far as one could make certain by feeling. It was impossible to see anything. Frenchy had stationed himself forward. He said he had a jump or two left in him yet. Here a faint smile altered for an instant the clear, firm design of Ransom's lips. With his serious, clear, gray eyes, his serene temperament, he was a priceless man altogether, soul as firm as the muscles of his body. He was the only man on board, except me, but I had to preserve my liberty of movement, who had a sufficiency of muscular strength to trust to. For a moment I thought I had better ask him to take the wheel, but the dreadful knowledge of the enemy he had to carry about him made me hesitate. In my ignorance of physiology, it occurred to me that he might die suddenly from excitement at a critical moment. While this gruesome fear restrained the ready words on the tip of my tongue, Ransom stepped back two paces and vanished from my sight. 
At once an uneasiness possessed me, as if some support had been withdrawn. I moved forward, too, outside the circle of light, into the darkness that stood in front of me like a wall. In one stride I penetrated it. Such must have been the darkness before creation. It had closed behind me. I knew I was invisible to the man at the helm. Neither could I see anything. He was alone. I was alone. Every man was alone where he stood. And every form was gone too. Spar, sail, fittings, rails. Everything was blotted out in the dreadful smoothness of that absolute night. A flash of lightning would have been a relief, I mean physically. I would have prayed for it if it hadn't been for my shrinking apprehension of the thunder. In the tension of silence I was suffering from, it seemed to me that the first crash must turn me into dust. And thunder was, most likely, what would happen next. Stiff all over and hardly breathing, I waited with a horribly strained expectation. Nothing happened. It was maddening but a dull, growing ache in the lower part of my face made me aware that I had been grinding my teeth madly enough for God knows how long. It's extraordinary I should not have heard myself doing it, but I hadn't. By an effort which absorbed all my faculties, I managed to keep my jaw still. It required much attention, and while thus engaged, I became bothered by curious, irregular sounds of faint tapping on the deck. They could be heard single, in pairs, in groups. While I wondered at this mysterious devilry, I received a slight blow under the left eye and felt an enormous tear run down my cheek. Raindrops. Enormous. Forerunners of something. Tap, tap, tap. I turned about and, addressing Gambrel earnestly, entreated him to hang on to the wheel. But I could hardly speak from emotion. The fatal moment had come. I held my breath. The tapping had stopped as unexpectedly as it had begun, and there was a renewed moment of intolerable suspense, something like an additional turn of the racking screw. I don't suppose I would ever have screamed, but I remember my conviction that there was nothing else for it but to scream. Suddenly, how am I to convey it? Well, suddenly the darkness turned into water. This is the only suitable figure. A heavy shower, a downpour, comes along making a noise. You hear its approach on the sea, in the air, too, I verily believe, but this was different. With no preliminary whisper or rustle, without a splash, and even without the ghost of impact, I became instantaneously soaked to the skin. Not a very difficult matter, since I was wearing only my sleeping suit. My hair got full of water in an instant, water streamed on my skin, it filled my nose, my eyes, my ears. In a fraction of a second I swallowed quite a lot of it. As to Gambrel, he was fairly choked. He coughed pitifully, the broken cough of a sick man, and I beheld him as one sees a fish in an aquarium by the light of an electric bulb, an elusive phosphorescent shape. Only he did not glide away, but something else happened. Both binnacle lamps went out. I suppose the water forced itself into them, though I wouldn't have thought that possible, for they fitted into the cowl perfectly. The last gleam of light in the universe had gone pursued by a low exclamation of dismay from Gambrel. I groped for him and seized his arm. How startlingly wasted it was. Never mind, I said. You don't want the light. All you need to do is to keep the wind when it comes at the back of your head. You understand? Aye, aye, sir. But I should like to have a light, he added nervously. All that time the ship lay as steady as a rock. The noise of the water pouring off the sails and spars, flowing over the break of the poop, had stopped short. The poop scuppers gurgled and sobbed for a little while longer, and then perfect silence, joined to perfect immobility, proclaimed the yet unbroken spell of our helplessness, poised on the edge of some violent issue, lurking in the dark. I started forward restlessly. I did not need my sight to pace the poop of my ill-starred first command with perfect assurance. Every square foot of her decks was impressed indelibly on my brain, to the very grain and knots of the planks. Yet all of a sudden I fell clean over something, landing full length on my hands and face. It was something big and alive, not a dog, more like a sheep rather, but there were no animals in the ship. How could an animal... It was an added and fantastic horror which I could not resist. 
the hair of my head stirred even as i picked myself up awfully scared not as a man is scared while his judgment his reason still try to resist but completely boundlessly and as it were innocently scared like a little child i could see it that thing the darkness of which so much had just turned into water had thinned down a little there it was but I did not hit upon the notion of Mr. Burns issuing out of the companion on all fours till he attempted to stand up, and even then the idea of a bear crossed my mind first. He growled like one when I seized him round the body. He had buttoned himself up into an enormous winter overcoat of some woolly material, the weight of which was too much for his reduced state. I could hardly feel the incredibly thin laugh of his body, lost within the thick stuff, but his growl had depth and substance. Confounded dumb ship with a craven, tiptoeing crowd. Why couldn't they stamp and go with a brace? Wasn't there one godforsaken lubber in the lot, fit to raise a yell on a rope? Skulking's no good, sir, he attacked me directly. You can't slink past the old murderous ruffian. It isn't the way. You must go for him boldly as I did. Boldness is what you want. Show him that you don't care for any of his damned tricks. "'Kick up a jolly old row.' "'Good God, Mr. Burns,' I said angrily. "'What on earth are you up to? "'What do you mean by coming up on deck in this state?' "'Just that. Boldness. "'The only way to scare the old bullying rascal.' "'I pushed him, still growling against the rail. "'Hold on to it,' I said roughly. "'I did not know what to do with him. "'I left him in a hurry to go to Gambril, "'who had called faintly that he believed "'there was some wind aloft.' Indeed, my own ears had caught a feeble flutter of wet canvas high up overhead, the jingle of a slack chain sheet. These were eerie, disturbing, alarming sounds in the dull stillness of the air around me. All the instances I had heard of topmasts being whipped out of a ship while there was not wind enough on her deck to blow out a match rushed into my memory. I can't see the upper sails, sir, declared Gambril shakily. Don't move the helm, you'll be all right, I said confidently. The poor man's nerve was gone. I was not in much better case. It was the moment of breaking strain, and was relieved by the abrupt sensation of the ship moving forward as if of herself under my feet. I heard plainly the suffing of the wind aloft, the low cracks of the upper spars taking the strain, long before I could feel the least draught on my face turning aft anxious and sightless like the face of a blind man suddenly a louder sounding note filled our ears the darkness started streaming against our bodies chilling them exceedingly both of us gambril and i shivered violently in our clinging soaked garments of thin cotton i said to him you are all right now my man all you've got to do is to keep the wind at the back of your head surely you are up to that a child could steer this ship in smooth water he muttered, I, a healthy child, and I felt ashamed of having been passed over by the fever which had been preying on every man's strength but mine, in order that my remorse might be the more bitter, the feeling of unworthiness more poignant, and the sense of responsibility heavier to bear. The ship had gathered great way on her almost at once on the calm water. I felt her slipping through it with no other noise but a mysterious rustle alongside. Otherwise she had no motion at all, neither lift nor roll. It was a disheartening steadiness which had lasted for eighteen days now, for never, never had we wind enough in that time to raise the slightest run of the sea. The breeze freshened suddenly. I thought it was high time to get Mr. Burns off the deck. He worried me. I looked upon him as a lunatic who would be very likely to start roaming over the ship and break a limb or fall overboard. I was truly glad to find he had remained holding on where I had left him, sensibly enough. He was, however, muttering to himself ominously. This was discouraging. I remarked in a matter-of-fact tone, We have never had so much wind as this since we left the roads. There's some heart in it, too, he growled judiciously. It was a remark of a perfectly sane seaman. But he added immediately, It was about time I should come on deck. I've been nursing my strength for this, just for this. Do you see it, sir? I said I did, and proceeded to hint that it would be advisable for him to go below now and take a rest. His answer was an indignant, Go below? Not if I know it, sir. Very cheerful. He was a horrible nuisance. And all at once he started to argue. I could feel his crazy excitement in the dark. You don't know how to go about it, sir. How could you? 
All this whispering and tiptoeing is no good. You can't hope to slink past a cunning, wide-awake, evil brute like he was. You never heard him talk, enough to make your hair stand on end. No, no, he wasn't mad. He was no more mad than I am. He was just downright wicked, wicked so as to frighten most people. I will tell you what he was. He was nothing less than a thief and a murderer at heart. And do you think he's any different now because he's dead? Not he. His carcass lies a hundred fathom under, but he's just the same, in latitude eight degrees twenty minutes north. He snorted defiantly. I noted with weary resignation that the breeze had got lighter while he raved. He was at it again. I ought to have thrown the beggar out of the ship over the rail like a dog. It was only on account of the men. Fancy having to read the burial service over a brute like that. Our departed brother. I could have laughed. That was what he couldn't bear. I suppose I am the only man that ever stood up to laugh at him. When he got sick, it used to scare that brother. Brother departed. Sooner call a shark brother. The breeze had let go so suddenly that the way of the ship brought the wet sails heavily against the mast. The spell of deadly stillness had caught us up again. There seemed to be no escape. Hello, exclaimed Mr. Burns in a startled voice. Calm again. I addressed him as though he had been sane. This is the sort of thing we've been having for seventeen days, Mr. Burns, I said with intense bitterness. A puff, then a calm, and in a moment you'll see she'll be swinging on her heel with her head away from her course to the devil somewhere. He caught at the word. The old dodging devil, he screamed piercingly, and burst into such a loud laugh as I had never heard before. It was a provoking, mocking peal, with a hair-raising, screeching over note of defiance. I stepped back, utterly confounded. Instantly there was a stir on the quarter-deck, murmurs of dismay. A distressed voice cried out in the dark below us, Who's that gone crazy now? Perhaps they thought it was their captain. Rush is not the word that could be applied to the utmost speed the poor fellows were up to, but in an amazing short time every man in the ship able to walk upright had found his way onto that poop. I shouted to them, It's the mate, lay hold of him a couple of you. I expected this performance to end in a ghastly sort of fight, but Mr. Burns cut his derisive screeching dead short and turned upon them fiercely, yelling, Aha! Doggone ye! You found your tongues, have ye? I thought you were dumb. Well then, laugh. Laugh, I tell you. Now then, all together. One, two, three. Laugh! A moment of silence ensued, of silence so profound that you could have heard a pin drop on the deck. Then Ransom's unperturbed voice uttered pleasantly the words, I think he has fainted, sir. The little motionless knot of men stirred with low murmurs of relief. I've got him under the arms. Get hold of his legs, someone. Yes, it was a relief. He was silenced for a time, for a time. I could not have stood another peal of that insane screeching. I was sure of it. And just then Gambrel, the austere Gambrel, treated us to another vocal performance. He began to sing out for relief. His voice wailed pitifully in the darkness. Come aft, somebody. I can't stand this. Here she'll be off again directly, and I can't. I dashed aft myself, meeting on my way a hard gust of wind, whose approach Gambril's ear had detected from afar, and which filled the sails on the main in a series of muffled reports, mingled with the low plaint of the spars. I was just in time to seize the wheel, while Frenchy, who had followed me, caught up the collapsing Gambril. He hauled him out of the way, admonished him to lie still where he was, and then stepped up to relieve me, asking calmly, How am I to steer her, sir? Dead before it for the present. I'll get you a light in a moment. But going forward, I met Ransom bringing up the spare binnacle lamp. That man noticed everything, attended to everything, shed comfort around him as he moved. As he passed me, he remarked in a soothing tone that the stars were coming out. They were. The breeze was sweeping clear the sooty sky, breaking through the indolent silence of the sea. The barrier of awful stillness which had encompassed us for so many days, as though we had been accursed, was broken. I felt that. I let myself fall onto the skylight seat. A faint white ridge of foam, thin, very thin, broke alongside. The first for ages, for ages. I could have cheered if it hadn't been for the sense of guilt which clung to all my thoughts secretly. Ransom stood before me. 
What about the mate? I asked anxiously, still unconscious. Well, sir, it's funny. Ransom was evidently puzzled. He hasn't spoken a word and his eyes are shut but it looks to me more like sound sleep than anything else. I accepted this view as the least troublesome of any, or at any rate least disturbing. Dead faint or deep slumber, Mr. Burns had to be left to himself for the present. Ransom remarked suddenly, I believe you want a coat, sir. I believe I do, I sighed out. But I did not move. What I felt I wanted were new limbs. My arms and legs seemed utterly useless, fairly worn out. They didn't even ache, but I stood up all the same to put on the coat when Ransom brought it up, and when he suggested that he had better now take Gambrel forward, I said, All right, I'll help you to get him down on the main deck. I found that I was quite able to help, too. We raised Gambrel up between us. He tried to help himself along like a man, but all the time he was inquiring piteously, You won't let me go when we come to the ladder. You won't let me go when we come to the ladder. The breeze kept on freshening and blew true, true to a hair. At daylight, by careful manipulation of the helm, we got the foreyards to run square by themselves, the water keeping smooth, and then went about hauling the ropes tight. Of the four men I had with me at night, I could see now only two. I didn't inquire as to the others. They had given in. For a time only, I hoped. End of chapter 6, part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.